Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the March 14th meeting of the Oklahoma City Planning Commission. Um, called the meeting to order at this time. Uh, for those of you who are new to our meetings, I'd like to uh, encourage you to read our uh, Planning Commission meetings, hearing policies and instructions for how we handle our meetings, which is on the back page of the cover page of our agenda. And uh, would commend those to you if you have any cell phones uh, or other electronic devices. I'll leave off pagers because it dates me. Um, please turn those off or silence those at this time. And um, if you have any comments or questions regarding a specific matter, if you direct those to the commission and not to the individual applicant, we'd be greatly appreciated. Keep your comments brief, direct, and to the point. And we'll all get out of here in a timely fashion this afternoon. So, uh, that said, call for approval of the minutes. I guess we should start with February 14th. Do we, do we have the right people? Motion to approve. Second. Okay, motion to approve the minutes for February 14th. Cast your votes. Those are approved. Do we have enough? Who was here? Oh. Okay, Janice, would you like to do that? I wasn't here then we can't approve them. So we'll hold those uh, for the last meeting. No, no, 14th. Oh, I'm sorry. We got an extra set. Okay, so moving to item B, approval of the February 28th uh, oh. minutes. All moved. Okay, Second. motion to approve the mi minutes of the February 28th. <coughs> Cast your votes. And those are approved. Okay. Uh, continuance requests. We have two. We have two uncontested requests for continuance today. Items 26, which is SPUD 701, a request to continue until March the 28th. And then item 34, SPUD 702, request to continue until April the 11th. Is anybody here to speak to us on either item number 20, item number 26, or item number 34? Commissioners? Move the uncontested request. A uh, motion and a second to approve the continuous item 26 and 34. Cast your votes. Those items are continued. Thank you. And then we have quite a few new requests for continuance. Um, bear with me. Item 1, C6440. Item 17, PC10324. Item 18, C6405. Item 19, PUD 1475. Item 20, C6388. Item 21, PUD 1482. Item 22, C6426. Item 23, PUD 1480. And item 24, C6418. Those will all be continued until March the 28th. Item 25 is PUD 1478. Will be continued until May the 23rd. Item 27, PV087, and item 28, PUD1483, will be continued until March the 28th. Item 29, CE847, will be continued until April the 11th. And then item 30, C6423, will be continued until March the 28th. Is there anyone present to speak to us on any of the items uh, that uh, Russell just read on the new request for continuance? Quite a list, so. Uh, did you read 27? I thought I did. Well, if not, we're including item 27 PV087 in that list also. Um, okay, Commissioner? I move approval on continuances. Second. A motion to approve the continuances as read. Cast your votes. Those items are continued. Um, before we move on, uh, there is only six. We have six today, so uh, if you've got a variance or you feel a little jumpy about your application and you prefer to present it to the full commission, uh, now might be the time for you to approach, if you care to. All right. Oh, Mr. Tagg? Roland Tagg, I'm here representing Market Center, uh, who is protesting item 7B8. It's PUD 1481. Um, 
Market Center is owned by two people, one of which is out of town and would like to be here. Also, Cheryl Hayes, the owner of the uh, building, or her company owns the building where the bicycle shop is that's on the west side of this proposed PUD, is unable to be here. She wants to be here. And of course, we would also like to have the full commission vote. Uh, I've talked to the applicant. The applicant will not agree. The applicant has continued the case three times before. We've never, we've just been told it's been continued. We didn't object. But we would like it continued for two weeks. Commissioners, Mr. Tag is speaking to us on item number eight, PUD 1481. Sorry, Rob. If I, if I may, David Box, 522 Colcord Drive, here on behalf of the applicant. Um, this has been continued uh, several times, and my client traveled in from out of state to be here, and we would uh, like to have it heard. We think it's ready to be heard. And uh, we would ask the commission to, to hear it today. Commissioners, any comment? This gentleman just told us. I'm sorry. Come, come up, give us your name, please. And uh, my name is Susan Cooper. I live at 88. Uh, North McKinley Avenue. I live on the corner um, on the south side of John Marshall High School. This gentleman just spoke to me and told me that um, there would be a continuance. I'm one of the protesters and he said that we're going to go for a continuance today. You don't need to be here. This Sorry we didn't take it. So which is it? Th this is a different case ma'am. I'm, I'm sorry. This is a, a different case. Y your item has been continued. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought they said that. <laughs> no. <laughs> Never mind. Okay. Thank you for coming down. Well. Um, okay. What, well, what's our bidding on number uh, eight, Commissioner? I have no problem with continuing, but what I would like to kind of get a clarification. I'd like to just get a clarification of uh, what, other than the uh, protesters, being, pro protesters being present, what do we stand to accomplish? Have, have we met with the, have you guys met before and have you made any kind of, any progress in a, in a positive way toward uh, coming to a consensus with this uh, case? We've met several times. We haven't come to a consensus, Mr. Williams. And if I may, we, we have, uh, this is the version that we are proceeding with today is the, the third version of the site plan. Um, and. We were told that there, there is no more middle ground, um, and so both parties are kind of stuck where, where they want to be. Um, and so from our perspective, there, there's nothing to be gained from a continuance from the standpoint of trying to come to a resolution of the matter. Mr. Chairman, we may typically <coughs> routinely grant a continuance to each side one time. <coughs> uh, what, and I'm not opposed to doing that necessarily, but what bothers me about this is it has been continued three times. Uh, we've seen it now in our packet three times. Mm -hmm. uh, the parties have been been talking. Uh, I I don't see what is gained by a continuum. Well, Mr. Chairman, my only my only support of the continuance would be that. We would have a full, uh, we stand a chance of having a, a full horseshoe here uh, that could hear it. And but there might not be a guarantee of that. Yeah. I mean, you know, so we may be in the worst position well, next I know time than we are this time. Well, I be here next time. Okay. I, I, I agree. I, I, it's, it's, it, it's a nice ambition. I, it, it seems to be a challenge for us of like. Uh, I'm for, uh, I, I don't know that we're going to reach any particular additional compromise, middle ground on this. It, it, the parties seem to be, I, I don't know what we would do or any further continuance meeting other than, I, I'm sure Mr. Hague, that, excuse me, Mr. Tag, that you're very comp competent to express the protesters, Ms. Hayes' position on this. I'm sure that you've had conversations with her. Uh, again, I... I think we, we have your arguments pretty well contained in your letter that you've submitted to us. Now, now, 
Ms. Hayes just authorized me to tell you that she protests. She sent a separate letter. Understood. And, and uh, Nick Preftex is the other principal. He's out of town. He would be here the 28th. Um, and specifically wants to, to be able to speak in addition to me. So we, we're, we've never asked for one before. Uh, and uh, to accommodate these people who want to speak, I, I would urge you to, uh, you know, the other three have been given to them. We've never asked. So we're, this is our first request. I don't view that as a right that, you know, both sides get a, you know, a freebie, but uh, I'm inclined to hear it today. Right. Well, and I, I think it's the, generally it's the applicant's consideration with respect to these. So I'm inclined to move it forward at this point. So. So am I, given that there doesn't really seem to be a lot of give and take going on between the parties, right. if they were talking and continuing to talk and, you know, making headway and compromise and negotiation and so on and so forth. But I think they've each got their positions fairly well staked out and that it's probably, you know, ripe to be heard. I agree. Is that your motion? I, uh, do we need we to have a motion? motion? For it's not really a motion that's required, I think. Yeah. Okay. We'll hear number eight in order. Uh, are there any other? Do we have? I mean, I, I have a note that somebody wants to speak on item 25. Is that person still here? Ms. Cooper? I think she's the one that left. So. I think she, she went outside. Yeah. Um, if she wants to speak, we could. Yeah, see if she wants to, as he thinks she wants to tell us. We'll... Hey, hey, All right, we're on uh, individual item, uh, uh, the consent docket now. There are two items on here. Item one has been continued. Item two is C6441. This is the final plat of Grand Plaza. Uh, and item three is C6442, final plat of Heritage Oaks. I thought one was continued. Yeah, one is continued. Items two, two and three, three we're hearing. Okay. Um, are there any persons here to speak to us on any of the matters on the consent dockets? Item two and three. Move the consent. Second. Motion is second to uh, approve the consent docket. Cast your votes. Those items are approved. On items requiring separate vote, item four is ABC 779, application by venue 104 Bistro and Catering for an ABC 1 at 10400 South Western Avenue, Ward 5. Is the applicant present on item number four? I'm going to move this to the heel of the docket. Sure. Okay. Item five is a. You going to move there? Yeah. Item five is ABC 780, an application by the Garage Burger and Beer for an ABC 2 at 6900 Northwest 122nd Street, Ward 8. I'm a Dave Zimmer, Housemith Restaurant Group in Norman, 3101 West Tecumseh. Uh, we're here for a uh, try to get an ABC overlay for a project in at 122nd Rockwell for a garage restaurant. Commissioners, nobody signed up on this. Move mm approval. -hmm. Motion second to approve item number five. Cast your votes. That item is approved. Item six is ABC 781 application by Jeff Rogers for an ABC one at 3621 Northwestern Avenue in Ward Two. Is the applicant present? Come up, please. State yes. your name. My name is Jeff Rogers, and I applied for the uh, ABC one overlay at 3621 Northwestern. <clears throat> Tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Basically, a taco shop. Kids, family, open uh, Monday through Sunday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. 
I have a copy of the menus here. If you guys would like to see these. <clears throat> Tell us about your parking. Uh, the parking, we actually meet all required parking. I think we have 15 spots, uh, one handicap. We meet all required parking based on our square footage of 1,356 square feet. Um, okay. Uh, also, just trying to be a good neighbor. Um, we've kind of been in communication with the uh, person who wrote the letter, the flower shop across the street. Um, I don't know if they're here or not. And then the Boys and Girls Club, we've reached out to them also. We'd also added a 10% of sales of one of our burritos goes to the Boys and Girls Club um, to try to be good neighbors as well. And then when you reached out to the Boys and Girls Club, the last time we had an application on this particular property, they were, they were, they appeared. What was their response to your um, conversation? Uh, conversation? They had just found out about it yesterday, so they, they were kind of caught off guard. Um, trying to process the whole situation, but before I think the application was for liquor. Mine's for three, two beer only. Uh, no, no liquor. So obviously they're not here today. So um, I haven't seen them yet. So, Commissioner, uh, do you have anything else you want to tell us at this time? That's it. Commissioner, any questions? For the applicant. Well, I. I would like to know what the Boys and Girls Clubs think about this. Um, you all will remember, I'm sure, that we've seen this site a number of times, um, always in connection with some sort of alcohol service, although I know 3-2 beer is not really alcohol in the eyes of the state of Oklahoma. But, you know, this is just very problematic at this site, even though um, it is possible to meet the, you know, parking requirement as a technical matter. It is adjacent to um, the Boys and Girls Clubs. It is, um, you know, in an area that there's never enough parking. Um, and it's, it's just not an area that I think we want to open the door to any kind of alcohol sales or service here. I cannot support this application. And um, unless there's somebody else here who would like to speak, I would move for denial. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> I will second Genesis motion, but first, we've seen this site multiple times. The, the leopard's not going to change its spots. Uh, he says he has 15 parking places. It looks like two of those are blocked off to me. It looks like only 13, but I'm not, I'm not getting into necessarily the parking argument. I agree with Janice, whether it's 13 or 15, whether it meets the requirement, doesn't meet the requirement. This is just what it's always been, and it, I just don't believe it's a suitable site. So I'll second motion. Um, I will say that we also have a letter from Mr. Black um, that you may have gotten, probably set out on your... Uh, okay. Um, There's also one in your packet from the florist. Right. Across the street. Right. Hill. We have that. Um, I will not necessarily advise the applicant, but you have to have five to pass. So a quick count says you, if you sweep the rest of us, you've only got four. So. <laughs> I'll give you a choice. You can have your application heard, or you can potentially maybe consider continuing your application to allow the Boys Club to appear for two weeks and see what the panel looks like at that time. That's kind of your call. But we do have a motion here. Let me, let me, a ask, let me ask you guys this. Uh, if, if, say, we continue for two weeks, and I went and spoke with the Boys and Girls Club, got you know, approval from those guys, got approval from the florist, and then come back in two weeks, does that strengthen my case with Ms. Powers? I can't even answer that question because it's a little bit like if pigs fly, would it strengthen your case? I cannot imagine that the boys and the girls clubs would, would support this application. 
Um, I, I would nonetheless not object whatsoever to taking a couple weeks and meeting with you and meeting with them. And um, I, I don't want to offer you any false hope mm -hmm. that it's going to change my vote or the vote of anybody else around the horseshoe. But um, if you want to take the time and do that, I'll be glad to do it. I would rather do that. Mm -hmm. I'll withdraw my motion. Okay. I move to continue this matter for two weeks. Two weeks going to be enough for you? Perfect. I will, will second the motion, but in doing so, sir, I'm going to tell you, <clears throat> the site's not going to change. The Boys and Girls Club is there, whether they support it or not. There's also a large, historic city park right there. Uh, I, I think you have an uphill battle here. Okay. Uh, motion is second. second to continue item six for two weeks. Cast your votes. That items continue. Thank you. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Item 7 is SPD 703, an application by Waste Management to rezone 3500 North Sooner Road from R1 single family to the simplified plan unit development, Ward 7. Uh, Keith Gibson on behalf of the applicant Waste Management. Uh, the SPUD uh, before you today is a success story uh, that occurred uh, several years ago. My client operates a landfill on the corner of uh, Northeast 36th and Sooner Road. Uh, we're passing out a uh, aerial so that you can get a better idea of the site. In landfill operations, the things that go into landfills normally decompose, resulting in gases. Uh, landfills usually just burnt them off, uh, flared them. In 2009, we approved SPUD 531 which was a small prototype facility to see if we could use something useful with the landfill gas. Uh, they are able to use 8% uh, of that uh, today on that small site. The SPUD uh, today, uh, we hope to use 80 to 90% of the landfill gas, so very little uh, will go off into the air. I have with me today Gary Blankenship, He's the uh, director of this project. He was also involved in 531. Uh, Peter Schultz is the director of landfills uh, for waste management here in Oklahoma. And I'd like to also report that I've met with Mike Wilson of the uh, fire marshal's office, who has no objections to this project. I've also met with Pat Downs of the Oklahoma City Riverfront Redevelopment Authority, who also has no objections. I've met with staff, there are no TEs, there are no protests that I'm aware of. Uh, staff recommends approval and we would of course do the same. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll be glad to uh, answer them at this time. Mr. Um, sounds like a success story. Uh, so I don't know if you've got any questions. I have one question. Uh, the, uh, Access drive off of a center road. Yes. I can't make it out on your plan. What material will that be? Uh, whatever's required. Um, we have whatever was on site for um, the other spud will be the same. Is it a hard surface? Or yes. A yes. Oh, okay. That's all I want to know. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I understand you're going to use the gas for your equipment that works the, the landfill? Yes. Are you going to sell gas? Will there be any open to the public? To no, 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 no. Okay. No. So it's strictly internal use for the gas. Yes. You're not going to ship it off yep. somewhere. Yep. Gary? Okay. State your name for us, Gary please, Gary uh, Houston, Texas. Uh, the, the gas is being converted into hydrocarbons which would include diesel fuel as one of the cuts. One of the cuts is wax. The wax is uh, some of the diesel fuel and the naphtha products will, will be hauled off site and uh, either uh, blended with other diesel fuel or sold as is to the commerce. Some of the fuel may be used internally 
for waste management equipment, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any further comments, questions? There's no uh, protest as I move that we approve the application. Second. So, motion is second to approve item seven. Cast your votes. It's approved. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, item eight is PUD 1481, application by Texacana Commercial Properties to rezone 700 Northeast 122nd Street from PUD 551 to PUD 1481 in Ward 7. Good afternoon, David Box, 522 Colcord Drive, here on behalf of the applicant. The applicant is also with me here today. Um, to start, I'd like to, to talk a little bit about the history of this site. Uh, back in 1996, this site was zoned for a mix of, of both multifamily and commercial um, along 122nd. The multifamily incorporated a golf course in the middle of it. So as it stands today and as, as it has stood since 96, it is certainly a unique multifamily property for this city in that it offers a, a very unique uh, green setting. Part of the intent of the original PUD in 96 was to permit the frontage along 122nd to be commercial. And part of the reason that was done, it was thought at the time that 122nd Street would be continued on to the east. Uh, as it stands today, 122nd Street dies uh, just about immediately east of this site. Uh, the reason that's significant is because it has prohibited this frontage from being developed commercially. So fast forward 17 y years later to today, and now you see the application before you. What we originally came in with was all 23 acres to be commercial. Uh, recognizing that some protest arose, we, we set out to revise our site plan. And initially, we revised the site plan to include commercial on the east and on the west side. Each of those is just over two acres. Uh, still having not satisfied the protest, we then came up with the third version of the site plan, and that is the site plan that you now see before you. And what that provides for is three separate tracks of commercial, <clears throat> both the east and the west, just over two acres. And the area shaded in pink on this exhibit is an additional two plus acres of commercial that span the current uh, access drive into this property. So in addition to that, we also provided for a 20 foot landscape buffer along 122nd for any portion where the multifamily tract would front on 122nd. And in addition to that, we have shielded all the parking behind the multifamily buildings. So you won't be able to see the parking from 122nd. And when we look at the original PUD, the intent was to buffer 122nd because it was thought that that was going to be a, a high volume commercial corridor. Well, that hasn't played out. And what we've done now is produced a, a site plan that, that matches what's already there and has been a successful product, uh, but still maintains the elements of buffering that were provided for in 1996. So with that said, we think what we've done is provided uh, development that will be successful, that will match what has been an extremely successful multifamily project. Uh, since, since they opened, I think they've maintained somewhere above 90% occupancy. So it, it's been something that it, it's an older complex, but it still looks new and it still has high demand. What we're proposing in the new portion of multifamily are three-story 70% brick, and I believe your packet has some renderings of what those buildings will look like. And that's what we're committed to. Uh, and we're going to incorporate this into the other development. The other development is 109 acres. We have limited the new portion of multifamily to 20 dwelling units an acre. And we think that it's both uh, appropriate for the area. We think the commercial satisfies both the protests east and west and to the north. And uh, overall, it's, it's a development that keeps in mind the, the issues that were around in 96, but recognizes 122nd is not going to be the commercial corridor uh, that people thought it might become. Now, if I can, I'd like to address a couple of the issues within the protest petition. The petition states that PUD, or excuse me, that 122nd was going to be a high use and exposure street frontage. And that is true. Back in 1996, that's what everybody thought. Uh, but there will be a slide in the PowerPoint presentation that uh, Mr. Fugue is going to show you to show you why that hadn't become a reality and it's not going to become a reality. The next area is the protest letter states that this will change 
the character of the area. I would submit to this commission that it, it does not do anything to change the nature or the character of the area. Um, it, it matches the character of the area. It's completely in line with what the character of the area is. The letter states that it eliminates the commercial buffer. Um, initially it did, and so that's why we now have the third version of our site plan that has two acres on the west, two acres on the east, two acres on the north, and in addition, a 20-foot buffer along 122nd Street. And finally, there is, is mention of a, a potential conflict with a potential tenant. And, and from our perspective, we believe when you, when you look at a zoning case, you look at what, what is appropriate use for the land, and uh, a hypothetical tenant uh, to us is not a, a valid consideration for denial of a, of a zoning. So we would submit to this uh, commission, just like the planning staff recommended, that uh, all the policies within the comprehensive plan for this sector we meet. Uh, we don't have anything in our application that is in conflict with the comprehensive plan. And uh, we would submit when you, when you meet all the elements of the comprehensive plan, um, we would ask for your approval. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my client, and he has a PowerPoint that I believe staff has on the screen. Good afternoon. My name is Kim Fugit. I'm with the Lindsay Company. I'm in, Fay in uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas. And uh, I don't know how we changed this, but go to the next one. Yes. Uh, the Lindsay Company uh, has been in business over 25 years, and we uh, manage and own over 36,000 uh, multifamily dwelling units in eight states. Um, we also have, uh, own and operate 42 golf courses uh, in those eight states. We have about 2,500 uh, multifamily units under construction uh, today. And uh, uh, Mr. Box mentioned that uh, the uh, particular, the subject property had been 90% uh, uh, occupied. We actually have a, uh, about a 98% occupancy rate uh, company-wide. Uh, actually, the, the greens there at uh, Oklahoma City, the subject property, has, uh, have three uh, apartments that are empty today. Uh, we're 99.5% 90, full. Uh, at that property. Uh, this just shows you the locations of the, uh, in the eight states that we're in. Um, and this is uh, where we are located uh, in the Oklahoma City uh, market, uh, anywhere from Norman to Edmond, uh, from Choctaw to Yukon. Um, now, what's unusual, and Mr. Box alluded to this, what's unusual about the product that we develop are the golf courses. And uh, we have 42 of these properties that do have golf courses, some eight-hole golf courses, some nine. But uh, that has been done by design for many reasons. Uh, the obvious reason is for recreation. Uh, another reason is for the, uh, just the green space and the quality of life that that affords. But the third thing is for the longevity of the, of the uh, products. And you know, as buildings and properties would uh, depreciate over time, uh, golf courses and, and park-like uh, developments will appreciate over time. I think that, uh, you know, if you look at Oklahoma City Country Club, for example, it's been there for over 50 years. The homeowners around there are still building new homes and renovating and updating their homes. It's a very sought after uh, environment. And so that was uh, purposely done in, in these properties to give us long life in these properties and to add value over time. Uh, this is the, uh, the location here in Oklahoma City. They're on 122nd and uh, uh, Kelly. Um, and you can, I think this slide shows well, you see the original 109 acres there below with the golf course and the, the uh, initial uh, development. And you see the, the smaller, the very small area that we're looking at, 23 acres, uh, there to the north that we're asking to, uh, to revise at this point. This is the, uh, the plan that you've already uh, seen and studied. And uh, I'll get a little, well, let me, let me start by saying that, uh, as David said, we have a commercial on each end and in the middle, but we have a 20-foot green space along 122nd Street. We'll also agree to construct a five-foot wrought iron fence along 122nd with uh, brick columns every 50 feet. That fence will uh, move in and out in its relationship to uh, 122nd, or, uh, yeah, 122nd Street to provide, uh, get away from just a, a straight run feeling there. You can see that we have uh, juxtapose the buildings. We've turned them to the street so that we don't get a, uh, a barracks look or a straight line uh, look down 122nd. Uh, we've internalized all the parking. 
So uh, as you're traveling down 122nd, you'll, you'll have to uh, look past the building uh, to see any, uh, uh, any parking uh, areas. Okay. Um, the amenities that we'll offer in this property, we'll, we'll build a, another clubhouse that we'll manage these uh, 324 units out of. Uh, we have on-site management at all of our properties. Uh, we have people that live in the clubhouse. Their dwelling quarters are above the clubhouse. They live there. They're there 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And that on-site management is uh, very critical to us, not only for, um, for the tenant, but also for uh, regulation and observation uh, of, our, of our properties. Uh, there will be a fitness center, a pool, uh, tanning, and of course these, uh, uh, these new uh, dwellings will have uh, access to the golf course as well. This is uh, a rendering that we developed uh, that would uh, take a look as you're looking uh, east on 122nd. Uh, you can see the, uh, the apartment building that we are proposing. Uh, there is uh, the first, there, there are three story building. The first and second floors are brick. The third floor is a uh, hardy board or cementous base siding. Uh, you can see the clubhouse there, uh, kind of the, has the six columns, uh, and it is uh, located there at the main entrance. And then the, uh, the other three-story building, all brick, is uh, a possibility uh, that would be located on that commercial tract in the center. Uh, we don't have plans to develop that yet, that we would leave that for commercial use, but uh, that just gives you an idea of what uh, perhaps a mixed-use building or uh, what type building might be uh, located there. Uh, <clears throat> as Mr. Box alluded, we, uh, we met with our neighbors uh, twice before uh, this meeting, uh, and that's why we had asked for continuous uh, the, the times that we have. This was the uh, original plan that we had submitted, and you can see that we, there's just a uh, commercial track there on the east end, uh, the hard corner, that we felt like might still be uh, used as some kind of uh, C-store uh, type use or bank or whatnot. Uh, after meeting with our neighbors and understanding their concerns about this uh, commercial buffer, we came up with the, the second plan uh, that indicates uh, another uh, commercial tract on the west end of the property, providing buffering to our uh, neighbor to the uh, neighbors uh, to the west and, uh, and also to the east. We also, in this uh, plan, moved our clubhouse from the, from the uh, south side to the north side uh, across from an existing office building uh, to the north. Uh, and uh, we're calling that a commercial zone to uh, there again provide commercial buffering uh, to that existing uh, structure there on 122nd. And finally, uh, we arrived at this plan um, offering the, two, the three commercial uh, zones, buffered zones, to our neighbors based on those uh, conversations that we had. Uh, we were still, uh, this still did not uh, meet their desires. Uh, they still had some issues with this, and so uh, we felt like that we couldn't uh, really go anywhere else other than where we were in 1996. So uh, that's why we're before you here today. Um, you know, in those meetings, uh, our, uh, our neighbors indicated that this, this use or, or developing or revising this PUD to be multifamily in this area was incompatible uh, with their plans on, on their property. Uh, not sure what incompatible means. We, we really didn't get into the definition of that, but if it means that uh, multifamily developments are incompatible with uh, commercial or office type developments, uh, we just, we just uh, started looking up in the, in the city uh, existing locations where multifamily uh, developments are adjacent to uh, commercial or office developments, and you can see all the red dots there. This is just in the northern uh, part of the city. And we got to 100 locations and, and stopped looking at that point. So um, there are examples all over uh, Oklahoma City where multifamily and, and uh, commercial slash office type parks are located adjacent to one another. Now, if incompatible means that the, and it's been alluded that uh, if incompatible means that the people who live in uh, multifamily communities are of a nature that is incompatible uh, with a, a group of people that would occupy office buildings, 
then I believe that that's just as, as wrong-headed uh, to judge or to stereotype one group of people based on where they live as it would be uh, on their ethnicity, for example. Um, we, we, there's no evidence uh, of that, that uh, people who live in multifamily communities are uh, of a lesser nature. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think if we had a show of hands here in this room today, uh, we'd find that most of us have lived in a multifamily uh, d uh, dwelling at some point in our life. We've lived in an apartment. And I, I think that uh, uh, it serves a purpose. There's obviously a need in Oklahoma City for this type of use as we uh, were 99.5% full over the last five years. We've been over 99% full and we have three vacant uh, units today. So there's obviously a, a strong demand for this. Um, this is the slide that Mr. Box alluded to earlier regarding 122nd Street where it stops to the east. In 1996 we predicted, if you will, that uh, 122nd would continue to the east. It would connect up at that point and become a thoroughfare uh, of traffic which lends itself to commercial development. Uh, that never happened, uh, not by any fault of ours or anyone's for that matter. Uh, I believe a lot of that had to do with the continuance of the Kilpatrick Turnpike. It was not extended to the west at the time that this property was developed and since that extension uh, we've all seen the, the expansion uh, uh, and development on that stretch of uh, uh, turnpike there to the north. So what may have been growth here may have moved there. Uh, who knows? Uh, all we know is that 17 years ago what we had uh, thought would happen obviously did not happen and uh, uh, it has not provided a, um, a good opportunity for us to develop that land commercially. Now uh, we have not listed the property. We have not put a sign up on the property. But I think if you will um, if you will visit with any regional uh, developers or national developers like Walmart or Walgreens or the way that we do business, uh, we don't go to the multi-list to look for properties. Uh, we do our demographics. We look at the areas that we feel like are uh, appropriate for our type use. We look at traffic counts and those numbers. Then we find properties in those areas. Uh, nine out of ten times those properties are not listed. Nine out of ten times they don't have signs on them. We go to the courthouse. We find out, find out who the owner is. We look those up and then we negotiate from that point. And I think that you will find, uh, uh, as I said, any national developer operates in that fashion. Uh, we have not had one call on this property in the, uh, since 1996. In 17 years, we've not had one call of interest uh, for any kind of commercial uh, development there. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, it was uh, told to us by our neighbors that who own the property across the street, eight acres that they've owned since uh, 89, 24 years, uh, that they've sold one tract uh, off of that eight acre tract in, in uh, uh, 24 years. So I think that's evidence that uh, there is not a need for commercial uh, development and uses uh, at this particular location, but there is definitely need for, uh, for multifamily uh, housing. And then the last side here is just, uh, we've got one more. Yes. Uh, just to finish up on uh, uh, the rendering here to answer any questions that you might have of me or uh, of the proposal. Commissioners, any questions for the applicant? Just a couple real quick. Um, Mr. Box, I think I heard you say the density was being limited to 20 to an acre. 20 dwelling units per acre. And I don't see that in our staff report, so I assume you don't wouldn't mind adding a I thought I saw that, Nick. Oh, well, maybe, maybe I missed it. Uh, I, I was just going was... through myself and thought I saw that. Well, I think the staff report actually says 25. 25 but the, is what the staff says. PUD uh, says 20. Okay, uh, so it is set out in the PUD. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, the staff report says 25 in tract one. Right. Tract one is the multifamily. Is the multifamily. So we want that to say 20. Cleared up in the staff report, what it is is 324 units on track one. If right. you look at just track one, it's actually 24 units per acre, just underneath 25. So, so when we made our adjustments with the staff report, we just said under 25 units per acre. So, so it says shall not exceed 25. Yeah. So it's, it's 324 units on track one. Okay. Well, I understand that now. Okay. okay. But I, I heard Mr. Box say 20, and that's what. what... Over the total. Okay. okay, over to, I got it, okay. And then uh, my la last question is, 
the rendering we see in that last slide up there, or the one I have here in my hand, either way. Yes, sir. That is what you're committing to build. On the multifamily portion, yes. Yeah. Um, and well, multifamily and clubhouse, isn't that clubhouse in the center? Is that the clubhouse in the center? Well, club, uh, clubhouse is the kind of the triangled uh, shape with the right. with the columns. Yes, sir. Yes, yes we are committed. To yes. Seventy percent brick. It'll be Thank you. first two floors of brick. Do we have a concept on the commercial development or, or not? No. In terms of how it's going to look? No. We'll have to come back through a specific plan, but, you know, the architectural elements are on the PUD. Any additional questions of the applicant at this time before we hear the protesters? Mr. Tag, would you like to come up, please? My name is Roland Tag. I um, Reside, reside office at 100 North Broadway, and uh, I represent Market Center. The, there are other protesters. In fact, there's over a 50 percent protest filed. Um, when uh, when my clients uh, bought and started to work on the 80 acres across the street, uh, they were relying upon old PUD 551, which said that this would be commercial across the front. Um, they have developed what is, they call a high-end commercial uh, development. They've put nearly $25 million in that development. They have marketed it to people, telling them that across the street is going to be commercial property. The staff report from that that 551 PUD said that a buffer was needed and this was an appropriate thing to do. Now, the applicants in meeting with us told us we have never marketed this property. They're in the business and they told us this, and I think admitted to you, that they build apartments. That's the kind of business they're in. They're not going to build commercial projects, at least they're, they're obviously very good at building apartments. Uh, their original plan showed that they would leave commercial down on the section line corner and the rest would be multifamily uses. Uh, the, the next plan that came along, which I believe is this one, uh, cut down the size of the commercial development on the corner of Kelly and 122nd and uh, created another uh, commercial uh, space, which is Track 2, that's on the west. Part of that Track 2 is, is limited because there is an easement through there that benefits the property on the east side of their golf course property. So it, it's, it's a smaller track. It, this is touted as a mixed-use development, but if you'll notice, they've put the pool, they have put the clubhouse on the commercial property. They have put parking on the other commercial property, and that's in track four. Now, they just told you that there would be 324 uh, apartments. When I looked at the plan, and the, the most recent plan, it said 342. Uh, maybe. I got my numbers transposed, but uh, that's what I saw on their plan. And that was the number of apartments that they proposed with their, their first proposal. Um, my clients feel that at this point to change is, is a betrayal of what they've relied upon. 122nd Street uh, was recently made into a four-lane section line. Uh, street. Uh, they have uh, marketed and developed this property that they own uh, with the, in the reliance that across the street there would also be commercial property. Now, the applicants will tell you that there are apartments next to commercial property, uh, but I'm not so sure that they're going to be able to tell you that there are apartments across the street from a high-end type of a commercial property that is uh, owned by, uh, by my clients. Uh, they're not seeking to put Walmarts in. Uh, they're seeking to put 
office type structures in. Uh, they're fine with a C1, but, but they are satisfied that putting in either 324 or 342, whichever the number is, of apartments will limit their future ability to market the property. It will limit the people who would occupy property. They primarily build and lease to people, uh, and that it's going to have a major financial impact up, upon them if this goes in. Effectively, you've gone from having, uh, if you add the 342 to the existing apartments behind, you basically have 930 or 40 apartments that will be now directly across the street uh, with the entrance coming right out on 122nd. Um, you know, I don't mean to malign apartments. I've lived in an apartment in my life, but uh, it always seems to me that uh, it's kind of like cars. Everybody likes their car for a while, but then they want the new, greatest, and best car out there. And that's when the apartments decline. And uh, I, I think that, uh, that the property across the street, as it presently is operated, is, is maintained well. But the marketplace may dictate that things do decline. So we, we have a strong objection to this use. Uh, the applicant has not attempted to market it, to, to put commercial uses in there. And uh, it's kind of hard to say that you can't if you don't try. And the reason for the buffer, and to our way of thinking, has not changed from the first part from the, when, the, when PUD 551 has, has ad, was adopted. In fact, if anything, it's strengthened by the fact that there is a high-end commercial development across the street. And we would urge you to deny this application. Commissioners, any questions for Mr. Tagg? I, I just have one. Mr. Tagg, your clients, I believe, have owned that prop, your property, uh, your protester's property, the market center. How long has that been open or available for occupancy? What, what's its history? I got to... The uh, Market Center Drive, we put in subsequent to the design market, which is the piece that you see under 7 PUD 797. Mm -hmm. We did that in, oh, I think we delivered that building in 02, 03. And so the Market Drive, I'd have to say that's probably maybe 95, 95 maybe, something like that. So um, Mr. Few Mr. Fewitt's assertion that we've been marketing and and, and developing that property for 24 years is incorrect. Um, it has been relatively recently. Of course, we've had some downturns during that time. Uh, right. We've, we've uh, uh, had some good success in what we have out there. Anybody that lives in that area and has been out that way can see clearly that we've spent a lot of time, a lot of money to uh, put together a development that is uh, first class. In fact, I would put that development up against any other one here in town. Uh, we just had a record sale price uh, for the Slumberger building that sold to the adjacent, you know, up against the turnpike. Uh, so, you know, the idea that somehow that this is not a commercially viable corridor is, again, incorrect. The assertion that 122nd Street, that, that there was some assumption that that was going to go through is also incorrect. In my history with this property, which has been a long time, because we've owned it for a long time, uh, 122nd Street has never been intended to go through, primarily because of the topography over there. So uh, that, that's, again, that's an incorrect assertion. The commercial uh, viability of this corridor is getting nothing but stronger with the four landing of 122nd Street, which was, I believe, improved in the 03 bond issue. Uh, in that same bond issue, I believe, and maybe it's an 07 bond issue, Kelly is to be four-laned, and that's in process now. We have a signal now at 122nd Street and um, uh, and Kelly. So, uh, and I'm, I'm just a little confused when they talk about the viability of a potential C store at the corner there of Track Three when 
they've already made the same assertion that this is not a commercially viable corridor. So um, in any event, we believe strongly that this is a commercial, uh, commercial corridor. We wouldn't have invested this kind of money in it if we um, didn't think so. Um, you know, a number of things are, and, I, and there is a, uh, I'll address one comment made as it relates to, um, you know, we market and lease, that's primarily our business, leasing. We represent, and we sell property also, uh, but we represent to those that lease and that we market to that there is a commercial buffer across the street. This is a covenant that was issued by the city some 15 years ago, whenever in 96. You know, Mr. Box's law firm is the one that drafted that PUD. They're the ones that, in the staff report of that time, a buffer was, you know, uh, considered appropriate. Nothing but any, there, there's nothing that has occurred since then that would diminish that logic today, up to today. In fact, a buffer has been, uh, you know, uh, the idea of a buffer is, is strengthened today because of what's going on out there, because of the city's, what the city's done from the infrastructure side. The other thing I want to emphasize, too, and, I, and I'll just touch on what Roland has said, you know, this is a 900-plus unit apartment project. It's not 320 or 340 units. Uh, you know, we have a, a property against one of the biggest, well, that's the biggest apartment complex in Oklahoma City. It's at Southwest 89th and, and Western. Uh, and it's a shopping center that we have continual problems with, with tenant vandalism uh, in that area. So, uh, and of course that shopping, that apartment complex has some time on it. Well, these will also get time on them too. Uh, and I will also say that a number of the people that we uh, promote to this project as it relates to leasing and, and, and sale, um, uh, we recently sold a, a site across the street. He would not have he would not have purchased from us if he would have known that the apartments were going to encroach that close on the street. And he definitely wouldn't have done it if he didn't known there was 900 units across the street. So, with that said, I just I just have to say that this is a commercially viable area. You know, things are happening in this area. We've just been awarded a a, a project on the corner of 122nd Street and and uh, uh, Kelly, uh, the new Social Security Administration office is going to be placed there. Uh, we have a couple other deals we're working on, and I'll touch on another one. We have uh, a deal in particular, and I've got some other ones that we're working on uh, that aren't quite as far along that require a separation from residential. Um, this will kill those deals. So, uh, again, I, w I would encourage the Commission to reject this application. Because what will happen is, and if it goes through here and then it'll go through council, you know, the city will be defending this in court. So, and I don't mean that as a threat. I'm just saying we, we will uh, take it to the next level. So, in, in any event, we feel very, very strongly. About, well, don't look, don't look, uh, you look, look confused. No, I'm not confused. I'm just trying to figure out your basis. But that's a separate conversation we can have. Basis, well, the, 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 uh, the diminution in value that we experience and also the inability to market to folks that do do require some separation uh, from the residential okay Commissioner? okay any event any questions? whatever that's worth well I just want to say I'm <clears throat> my, my conflict with this is um, I've seen this work uh, Frisco Texas which was all farmland uh, at one point, now has a pizza hut, soccer park, has all this commercial, and it's got these apartments that just surround this property. And I, I, I dare you to tell me that that's not working. Uh, that's the, I mean, that's an excellent uh, example of how apartment communities, uh, multifamily, uh, work. On the other side, uh, if I were David Box, I would be offended by you comparing 89th and Western, which is a travesty to the project that they're recommending. Anybody, any other comments? Questions? The applicant or the protesters? 
I, I'll just clarify the, the 324 versus 342. It's 324. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I've, I've looked at the, uh, listening to both sides of it. Um, this area has been slow to develop. I mean, that's obvious. Uh, I appreciate what Marketplace has done. Uh, it's on a good path. Uh, it was stated that uh, the commercial on the south side of, uh, with the applicant, that it would only be for like office and things. But when I look across at uh, PUD 687, there's a whole block of small office sites that's been allocated for a smaller office complex. I think that uh, there's been a good attempt to try to come to a point of uh, resolution with this issue. I like it that the, the proposed development is a good mix, and it brings a mix to the whole equation. I think it also brings uh, the possibility for housing. When we look at uh, mixed-use developments, it brings a possibility for housing for all the commercial development that is, is expected to take place. So it, to me, it's a compatible use at this point in time. And I'll make a recommendation that we'll approve this application. Second. Second? Oh, we have a second. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Okay. Comments? I might add with my second. <clears throat> what James said, it's been slow to develop, but I've also seen three attempts work with the protesters, three different iterations. It looks like these, everything that we preach and ask for applicants to do, it appears that it's been done. Uh, they haven't agreed. Uh, they're not going to agree. Uh, but the way this is configured, the way the apartments sit on 122nd, uh, it's a, a good buffer. Uh, I'd see no reason not to approve it. Janice? I have to agree with that. I, I really don't see how it would be possible for us to take into consideration what impact the rezoning of this property would have on the contractual obligations of a property owner elsewhere. Um, I, I mean, that is not a valid consideration for land use decision in my view. I also find it difficult to imagine that a relatively sophisticated real estate developer would view any zoning in Oklahoma City as a covenant of some kind or um, a, an obligation for that zoning to remain in place in perpetuity. I mean, clearly there was a reason why the former PUD was adopted and structured the way it was. I think, you know, a sufficient amount of time has gone by for the developer to see that that concept is not going to come to fruition, that this particular parcel is not going to be developed commercially. I don't think they have any obligation to meet some kind of standard or criteria set by another property owner of how hard they should try to do that. I'm sure they'd be glad to do it if they could. But I also think that this development that's proposed here really kind of makes more sense adjacent to a golf course than commercial development does in terms of this property, what's appropriate for it, the way it's going to develop, and what makes sense. I, I think that what's being proposed is a good choice. You know, I, I look at this map that was furnished to us, um, the compatibility of commercial and multifamily. And I think a good example of that is uh, at Memorial Road in uh, Penn. You know, that there's all kinds of apartments in there. There's all kinds of commercial. They seem to fit very well. Uh, the properties are well maintained. <clears throat> and here the guy... The gentleman has showed us a hundred uh, locations where commercial and multifamily marry together, uh, and uh, I think it's a good fit also. All right. Motion is second to approve item number eight. Cast your votes. That's approved.
Item 9 is C6439. This is a preliminary plat of Calm Springs in Ward 1. Mr. Hagan. Good afternoon. I'm Phil Hagan with Craft and Tone Associates, representing the applicant on this case. Uh, what we have before you is a preliminary plat for 80 acres located on the south side of Britain Road, just east of the turnpike. There is a 20 foot or 20 acre buffer between this property and the turnpike. Um, all utilities are to this site. The property is zoned as a PUD, which had a reversion clause in it, which reverted back to R R1, so it's zoned properly. Um, we are asking for no variances, and we are in agreement with all TEs. Commissioners, nobody signed up. Any questions for Mr. Hagan? Motion is second to approve item number nine. Cast your votes on that. It's approved. Thank, Thank you. you. Item 10 is DA 23714. This is an application by Two Structures Homes for a lot split on five properties of 6917 through 6933 Mayberry Lane in Ward 8. I'm Jay Evans. I uh, own two structures and I'm the one making the application. Mr. Any questions? all of your property now? Yes. So yes. we're not going to see any more lot splits? No. <laughs> not on this lot? Not on this property. <laughs> I, 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 I might take some more of yeah. <laughs> uh, that. That means we can't come back on another That's why we made plats. <laughs> any protest? Nobody signed up. Move approval. Second. Oh, uh, let's back up, Nick. We did, as Susan rightly says, we have a variance to TE number one. one. Yeah, this is a variance application. I'm sorry. Move the variance. Cash your votes on the variance. It's approved. Now move the application. Thank you. Cash your votes on the application and it's approved. Thank you. Item 11 is SPD 704, an application by Garrett and Company to rezone 300 Northwest 95th Street from R1 single family to SPD 704, Ward 7. Pat Garrett with Garrett and Company. Any questions? Commissioners, Mr. Garrett's in front of us again. Um, any questions on this application? Comments? Nobody signed up. Move approval. Second. Motion is second to approve item 11. Cast your votes. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Garrett. Item 12, PC 10332, an application by Iron 7 Promotions to rezone 3901 Noma Road from R1 single family to RA single family, Ward 4. Uh, Warren Peacock with WPM Design Group representing the applicant. We continued this from two weeks ago because of some concerns uh, Commissioner Allen had about the pumping rates of the wells and a couple of concerns about an abutting neighbor. <clears throat> we have tested three more wells. Uh, they came in at, uh, I believe they were 23 gallons a minute, 30 gallons a minute, and 45 gallons a minute, uh, which is more in line, I believe, with what that area does. So we, we think we've well, that makes five wells we've tested. They've all been above the requirement that the city allows. Um, we've also made some modifications to the preliminary plat, which is going to be talked about next. And I can pass out a revised drawing at that point in time. But we are going to maintain the pond, and we also are going to go to uh, curb and gutter streets in the, uh, in the development. All right. One other Wait, stipulation. On, are we on 12? Are you on 12 yeah. now? Okay, good. One other stipulation I talked to Mr. Cordray about is bringing all construction traffic in on the frontage road to the south. Okay. And that will be in the PUD. Well, that, well this is really not a PUD, but we can. Um, I think we're getting confused here. We're on the, because we're on the rezoning first. Yeah, it's not a PUD. It's a straight. Oh, it's not. It, I'm yeah. sorry. It's but, we will commit to do that, and we'll just have to we'll have to figure out how to work with the contractors to ensure that happens. It could be more of a sequencing type of construction sequencing than, than anything else. Well, Mr. Williams down on the corner has offered his land to put up a no construction traffic on uh, Noma down through there. So, and I don't know how you're going to get it around, but I think it is a good idea, and I think you've already 
I've committed to that. So we'll do our best to accommodate that. I'm not sure either, but we we would commit to do that. Sure. Yeah. Okay. With that, I'll make a motion to approve that there's no protesters. No protesters on item 12, <clears throat> commissioners. Motion is second to approve item 12. Cast your votes. That item is approved. And item 13, 6422, is a preliminary plat of Chandler Crossing, same property. Uh, we have, we are going to modify the pond, but we are going to leave the pond in to be almost an acre. Um, we still are going to have to request the variance to the TE because there's a requirement of a 24% open space, which would be five acres in this development. Uh, that's, we, we would like to request that variance, but I've got a revised plat if you'd like to see it. Of course, I said we're going to uh, also put in curb and gutter streets. So this is a decision the developer made that just makes it a better development for sales. There's one thing that's kind of bothering me. It's not okay. I mean, it's in general, not not just this subdivision. But in a meeting uh, last week, um, we've discovered that fire suppression. It's not all, especially on well, on a house that has well uh, in, you know, involved as far as water goes. We've, we were told basically when we started this is that insurance uh, prices would go down if we had fire suppression. That's just the opposite from what we understand really? from reality. Okay? We're also, it was also indicated to us on a 2,500 square foot house that uh, $3,000 in that neighborhood would be uh, about the cost uh, to put that suppression system in. That's not the case. It's, gonna, it's running five to $6,000. And then we've already had a subdivision come in and uh, asked to relinquish the fire suppression because they couldn't sell the houses because people did not like the fire suppression. They were afraid of it. And I'm not really sure that I want fire suppression on these. Uh, we're we're going to have a meeting, or I'm going to ask a question of, of the uh, fire department at the end of this meeting, and we're going we're to talk about that some because it, especially with houses on, on well, uh, I think we're shooting ourselves in the foot. The other thing I've heard too about the suppression systems on a well system is the fire basically destroys the electrical in the house, and when that happens, it's the well don't well, the well won't work. So that's another issue. Now, I understand the fire department's you know safety of life and that type of thing, I, but I think there is some issues that maybe it needs to be. Well, and, you bit. know, and, and this comes from uh, you know fire records. Most of the fires or a lot of the, the fires, the majority of the fires, start in the, in the garage. Yeah. And then out in, in, the rural, or in the area that we're in, uh, the next thing is uh, uh, wildfires. Right. And fire suppression doesn't help you there. Right. So, you know, that's something that we, we sure want to talk about. And maybe by the time this thing gets ready to go, we'll have that settled. We'll, we'll comply with whatever the requirements are at the time we come back. So that's not a problem. Uh, okay, so I've I just, what I understood this application last time was you were agreeing we, we still to are. do sprinklers. Yes, we still are. Okay. It, it's that still that has not there. changed. Yeah. It's, it's still in. Yeah. yeah, all right. It, all it's right. just if the policy changes before we get back, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll flip and change and go with that direction. Okay. All Whichever right. the wind blows much. that day. So all right. We've got a variance. That's right. I'll move the variance. Motion and a second to approve the variance TE3. Cast your votes. It's approved. And I uh, recommend approval for the application. Second. Motion and a second to approve the application. Cast your votes. That's approved also. Thank you. Warren. Item 14 is P010336A, application by Shaz Investment Group to rezone 
19601 North Pennsylvania from PUD 1349 to the R4 General Residential District in Ward 8. Good afternoon, David Box, 522 Colcord Drive, here on behalf of the applicant. <coughs> the Commission will remember this is the uh, second portion of the uh, application that came before on the last docket. The portion immediately north of the subject on the screen that says proposed R1ZL, uh, what we had was at this, at the last Planning Commission docket, we had a, a host of people that submitted a protest letter and uh, several people showed up. And so what we agreed to do was move forward with the proposed R1ZL and we would go back and, and visit, if need be, on uh, the 2.2 acres of R4. Uh, a little history, the, the genesis of this application stems from the neighbors to the, the west that abut this to the west are uh, homeowners within one original PUD and what that original PUD called for was duplex zoning where the R1ZL is and office zoning where this proposal is. And when the applicant went to Platt for the duplexes, the uh, existing neighbors um, protested. And so they, they came to an agreement that what, what they wanted was R1ZL uh, on the five acres and multifamily on this portion. And I, I have a 46 signature uh, support petition that, that memorializes that agreement with, with the applicant. So uh, the applicant then uh, paid to come before this commission and, and asked for those two separate tracks. Since the last meeting, I've been in communication with the president of the Thornhill HOA, and uh, what, what you just had passed out kind of shows where there was some confusion. Uh, the, the red and the yellow tract are the two portions that we are seeking to rezone, uh, the red reflecting the R1ZL and the yellow reflecting the multifamily. The green portion is a pre-existing PUD uh, that allowed multifamily. And when the notice went out, it happened to correspond at the same time when development began on this green track. And they thought that the notice, what they were coming down here to protest, was that project. Um, they didn't know that their neighborhood actually came later in time than the pre-existing multifamily zoning. So um, the last correspondence I had with, with the president was, you know, the, the damage was already done. We were confused. You know, we didn't think, we don't think we need to, to slow you down. Um, and I have no more correspondence a after that. So talking about just this tract, it's 2.2 acres. And when you look at the 2.2 acres, you should have a, one of the sheets in your packet. But uh, this has both a pipeline easement and street right away that totals 0.88 acres. So when you look at the total developable um, acreage on this, it's right at 1.4 acres. So in our belief, uh, the, the impact isn't that great, but more importantly, uh, this is an agreement that was reached with the neighbors uh, that are most affected, and, and that's what the applicant wants to um, hold up his end of the bargain with that. Uh, staff recommends approval of this application. And we would ask for the same, and I'm here to answer any questions. So, one, at, talk, just wait, wait, one question, though, if I could, Nick. The only piece of property in front of us today, since we already approved the R1ZL, is what's outlined now in the yellow. Yes. Is that right? Red's... Red we took care of last meeting. Green is not even a part of this application. Correct. But that pre-existing multifamily zoning. So all we have is the 2.2 acres, which is with the 0.88 acres of uh, right-of-way and easement going through it. Correct? Correct. My, my apologies for this looking like a, a stoplight. That was unintentional. <laughs> it, in, I'm kind of, surprised you didn't outline your part in green, but that would have been just as a... I didn't pick the color. Next time, you know. Like That's colorblind. He actually picked mm -hmm. it. So. In that Go ahead. regard, Mr. Chairman, the staff report indicates that 7.04 acres. It's really two as opposed to seven. Okay. Uh, but, Mr. Box, let's talk about those two acres. Yes, sir. That is roughly half developable and half not, as Chairman pointed out. We have right away and all sorts of things there. So when we build apartments there, and apartment densities, 32, maximum densities, 32 to an acre, does that mean we get to build 70 apartments or 35? Well, when you look at what apartments require as far as parking and setbacks and things of that nature, um, you couldn't shove as many as, as uh, the 64 into that, that smallest space, and that's why we thought that the impact would be uh, very minimal. 
and yet you haven't put this in a SPUD to limit that density. And you mentioned the Thornhill across the road doesn't like the existing apartments that are already there, which I ironically noticed the staff report points out as being a favorable consideration. Uh, <clears throat> is there any way that you can give us assurance as to how limited this will be? Well, I don't think we can make any guarantees on anything, but um, in looking at whether or not a, a, an SPD would be appropriate in, in limiting densities, we felt like we had a, a very unique parcel where not only the code, uh, but pre-existing conditions with right-of-ways limited that for us. Um, so it, it, it took the place of, of needing to do a SPUD because um, the ability to develop this site is limited both by uh, the code requirements uh, and pre-existing conditions. So. Code allows you to build a pretty tall apartment house there, backing up to all those houses. I, I'm, I'm curious. I'm sure that your client, is being a prudent businessman, has calculated how many units the properties. I mean, you got an idea. You didn't just go ahead and come before us because you didn't know. I can uh, only assume that he negotiated this with the neighbors, and uh, they conceded the multifamily as opposed to making the whole seven acres or ones of yell. Well, I, I can't speak to the specific negotiations, but um, I know that these, these two acres are just uh, unique and have some serious limitations. And so uh, I think that was part of why the existing neighbors uh, felt comfortable with this and with the fact that you have the R4 to the south, um, we deemed it appropriate. So let's stop dancing. How many units are we talking about? As of now, there are no, no plans to build um, a, a complex. So we don't know how many units there are, or will be. Right, there are no current plans, correct. Well, and, and to that end, you know, the, the effort was to, to satisfy the neighbors, and it was a, a package deal. And it, it got broken up as far as, you know, these two dockets, but the... I objected to that, if you recall. <laughs> <laughs> and you did, and you did. Um, but um, I, I believe that uh, we were able to satisfy at least the the president of the HOA, um, that our application was um, appropriate for, for what's already out there. Well, Mr. Box, is the new standard that the developer goes out and, and makes a zoning agreement with the neighborhood and then comes to us to have it rubber stamped? Oh, I don't know if it's the new standard, but, um, you know, maybe, maybe it, it, not necessarily rubber stamping, but I, I think it should be, um, as any good developer, he, he heard the protests and, and he adhered to, to what the complaints were in the neighborhood and he felt it appropriate to, to listen to them and the people have spoken and this is what, what they want. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I am somewhat, I have no idea how many apartments, this is not a trick question. Right? No, it I mean, is not. It, there, there, there's a question that, that, that should be relatively easy to answer. It's, it's, gee, we're not exactly sure, but probably the maximum would be 100. Or, well, or maybe it's 120. I'm I mean, so, people don't just go do these things without an idea about how many units they could put on the property. And I'm not saying this is feasible, but right. just what if the pipeline easement goes across their diagonally? What if it's economically feasible for me to go in and move that pipeline into the other right-of-way for the guy and free up my other two acres, and now all of a sudden I have twice as much developable land? Right. I doubt that could happen on this small site right. from a practical standpoint. But we don't have any specificity here at all other than just, and I, and I know it's a small site mm -hmm. with limitations, yeah. but... I'm just not real comfortable, and I think they could fix this simply by coming back with a SPUD and telling us what they want to do. Or at least give us some indication. Like I said, everybody knows. Well, I can commit that we're not going to attempt to, to pay to move a, a gas pipeline in order to increase the ability of, of this site to develop. Um, I think maybe some conventional wisdom was the, the, the owners to the south might view this as an opportunity to incorporate this into their development like a clubhouse or some parking 
because of the limitations on development or a clubhouse, you know, or the pool or something like that. Um, but I think that th there are no plans, but I think that that is, you know, the conventional wisdom that, you're, I mean, you're not going to be able to put 64 units on this. It, it is probably most valuable to the folks to the south uh, that could utilize this as, as, a, as a benefit to their, their complex. But there you make even a, a stronger argument for us to know what's going on. If they have it and it's straight zoning, you know, maybe they can figure out a way to build a red pipeline here. I doubt it. But, and they would. Whereas perhaps your, your client would not. Well, and I think all we can go by is, is uh, one, first and foremost, what, what the comp plan says, what, what the nature of the, the uses around the area is. And at least in, in staff's position in reviewing it, they felt this was totally in conformance and appropriate, and, and as such, they recommended approval. Well, in general, there is an abundance of R4 land already uh, along this North Strip, and if this was a larger site, I would not favor it at all. Uh, it's so small, I frankly don't care if there's another couple acres of R4. But I would like to know what, what's happening there, and, and this application does not do that for me. Well, I, I think there's a simple end. I mean, look, um, when I ask a simple question, <laughs> a very simple question, it's a simple question. Oh, get rid of the pipeline. Say it doesn't exist. How many units could you put on 2.04 acres? I mean, that answer is known. Well, and so I find it troubling when a simple question is asked and I get zero response. Not even kind of maybe it's between 25 and 30, but I get no answer. And the, and the reason it's that's, not. That's, 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 that's troubling. The, the reason it's not me. known, it wouldn't be known until you, you set to put it on a site plan and know what your parking requirements were, what your setbacks were, what your height limitations were. And so it's, it's not as easy as saying this many units an acre are allowed. You have to look at each site and know how it would actually develop. Okay, I, I will offer you the same um, we have a advice that <laughs> uh, Commissioner Hensley offered another applicant. You've got three commissioners around here who are not comfortable with the amount of specificity in front of them today. Um, and so you, the question is, do you want what's probably going to be a denial, or would you like to take a couple weeks and think about whether you want to do an SPD or whether you can um, drum up more votes among those who are not with us today? We have a protester, too, by the way, so oh, okay. you might want to hear Let's... that. We haven't forgotten you. <laughs> uh, Ms. Miranda, would you approach, please? A lot of things you brought up today were similar to the feelings that we had um, two weeks ago. Oh, I'm sorry. My name's Elizabeth Miranda. Thank you. Um, I live at 19544 Talavera Lane, Oklahoma City, 73012. Um, I'm a board member for the Thornhill HOA, uh, which is just located just across the way to the east of the property that they're trying to rezone. And we did not hear about this until about two weeks ago because the, the land be, that's directly across is vacant. It belongs to our developer. And he just let us know about it two weeks ago. And so we didn't know anything about the negotiating that, that was going on across the way. Um, I actually went across there. I went and knocked on doors and asked, do you know what's going on? And they said, oh, I, I, no, there's not going to be any uh, apartments. They were confused. They, they really didn't know. I put up a sign. <laughs> in front of their uh, neighborhood telling them about a hearing and they tore it down. They're like, apartments? It, it, there was, they just didn't understand exactly what all that entailed. So I don't know who those 50 were that signed it. I don't think they understood what they were swapping for and that it was still another apartment complex going in. Um, and I have a petition from our neighborhood and from other neighbors around. Um, some of them do live in La Sonata, which is, um, the, you know, part of the ones that signed it. Um, and I don't know if I turn those in, but there's also comments. Uh, what you're bringing up before is exactly what I felt when we showed up two weeks ago and asked for the, tenu the continuance. Um, we asked Mr. Box 
why he was doing this or why his, um, the applicant was, was rezoning. And he said, well, you know, we're just going to kind of match the people next to us. And I asked, is there going to be any plans? Mm, no, just a little, just, it's not going to be big, just a little something just right here. Not, not a big deal. Just, and they said, if you'd like to have a meeting and, and meet with us and we can tell your, the, your residents what we're going to do. And we said, yeah, that'd be great. We'd love to come and meet with you and, and, uh, and, and hear exactly what your plans are. And um, our president, who, um, he's not here today, but he, um, Brian, he spoke to uh, Mr. Box through email uh, over a week ago, and we asked if we could hold this meeting. And uh, he said he was going to forward the information to um, the Shaw's development and get back to us. And we didn't hear back until the beginning of this week, and it was just, it was just getting too hard. We couldn't actually organize anything to actually meet with them. Um, but a lot of things that you brought up are the same. We're concerned with how many homes are going in. Um, there's a set, the PUD, you know, it, it's not that old. It's from 2008, uh, established a density of 477 units over a 79.8 acre lot. Um, and the PUD does state, you know, we're not going to increase that. Um, of course, we understand if things change and the neighborhood needs it, that, that you would up that. But I don't think that's what our neighborhood needs right now. Um, if you take the two and two quarters, and you actually multiply it out times the 34.84, it works out to 78 potential uh, units that they could put in there. And we don't know because they don't have plans how many they're going to put it in. And we actually suspected that they were trying to sell it to the um, Danforth Apartments, who is who already bought the R4 land. It is there; they've broken ground. I've talked to the um, the the, uh, the the construction. Uh, uh, who's in charge of the instruction, and he says that they, uh, they didn't have any plans yet, but it sounds like, from what Mr. Box said today, that they were thinking maybe they would sell to them. And that worries us because they have a set amount of units that they've already planned to put in, which is 143, but if they in get a little bit more land, they could put more in, higher level, we don't know. So um, and what our neighborhood does really need is that we need more commercial in here. And it's, it's just too early to start pulling those things out when we're just growing. We have two lanes. It's like dirt on each side. We haven't been expanded at all. We're just, there's horses across the way just on a one, uh, on 192nd, the southwest corner, um, sorry, southeast corner, 192nd. There's still horses there. It's just, um, Sorry, the second, the zoning, the, the lot removes office use that was supported in the design of the PUD. Um, the, they actually stated the Oklahoma City Plan designates this area for um, urban growth. High quality commercial, institutional, and residential uses at various densities are encouraged. This area is still growing and still needs diversity. Um, and also, this is a problem that in the master plan 1.1, it states, the county has been experiencing a disproportionate percentage of new residential without needed support from our commercial development. And this is very true for our neighborhood. Um, as far as adding the higher density, I mean, we're getting that in already. That's, that's right next to us um, in the PUD 1225. Um, finally, and this is our big concern, there is no current traffic uh, study that has been conducted. And this neighborhood, it is. It's really booming, and the thing that's not pointed out is just to the north. I mean, it's um, it's kind of touches part of the PUD 1339. Sorry, 1349. Um, there is a new elementary school that's being built right now. It will be opening up this fall. Um, it's yeah, it's it's just in that block. It's just north of that. And also, um, there was a a bond that was passed in February of just last month. Uh, that granted the um, Edmond School District to put in a middle school right next to that. So that's all very new, and it's going to really increase the traffic in the area. Um, there's a duplex that was just a huge duplex, like 400 unit one that was just approved on Western and um, 192nd. We have two large churches that are really growing. We have Acts 2 and also Life Church TV. That's they're both less than a block away. So these are all big concerns, and before we rezone, I think they really should give us more information, or um, we, we really just urge you not to pass this. 
Commissioners, any questions from uh, Ms. Miranda? I'm sorry. Thank you for coming down. Thank you. Mr. Box, comments? Yeah, just not, not as much comments as, as clearing up what the facts are. Um, on the support petition, uh, the idea that they didn't know uh, what they're signing, I'll, I'll read into the record what, what it is that all the supporters signed. Uh, we, the undersigned residents of the La Sonata addition, support the change of zoning uh, for La Sonata Section 6 from multifamily zoning to PUD planning and development zoning for 40 lots suitable for single family homes. We further support the rezoning of the parcel south of La Sonata from office zoning to multifamily zoning. So uh, they, they certainly knew what, what they were signing. Um, and to the, to the comment that we didn't get with them until this week, I actually have emails um, from March 4th, which was a full week and a half ago, uh, when the HOA president and I started communicating. The last communication I got from the HOA president was, it is my opinion that the damage is already done, and it is a waste of time to hold you all up. So um, I am always willing to meet w with anybody, and you can have the, the email chain, but uh, I, on behalf of all my clients, am always willing to meet, and the email chain starts on March 4th saying, my client and I will come, you set up the place, and we'll be there. And the last correspondence I said was, there's no need to hold you up. So I don't want the commission to think that we have avoided trying to meet, because that's not true. Okay. We understand that. But you're before us now. Uh, and you're not giving us the degree of specificity I think we need. Uh, I would like for you to bring this back as a spud, and apparently you're not willing to do that. My client has uh, asked for a vote. Okay. All right, right then. Nick, you got a motion? Move for denial. Motion to deny item number eight. And a second, cast your votes. One, two, three, nope. no vote. See you next time. Uh, uh, another motion? Motion to approve? Or I don't know if it'll do us any good. Nah. So. Could we move on without a recommendation and let the record reflect the vote was four to two? Uh, <laughs> I could. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to move that. Thank you. <laughs> Item 15 is PUD 1484 application by Ron Walters to rezone 1300 North Missouri from R1 single family to PUD 1484 Ward 7. Um, before we start that, just Ms. Miranda, so you understand, that means that th this will be passed to the next meeting of the Commission because there wasn't enough to up or down which will be on April, March 28th, or any other parties that were interested in that application. <clears throat> Sorry, Mr. Walters. Sorry. Uh, Ron Walters, 8501 South Walker. Uh, I might direct you all to, I think it's page 10 within your documentation. Is this right here as we talk about this? Project might help a little bit explanation about it. Uh, this is uh, uh, the first of development in one of the strategic neighborhood initiative areas, one of the three neighborhoods that the city has been working on uh, to start revitalization in. Uh, we've worked for the last three or four years uh, just south of here in the uh, JFK area over off of 4th to 8th and Martin Luther King and uh, have been very successful developing single family homes, duplexes, uh, for sale and for lease both. Uh, we're very, very excited about this project. This is a move uh, into this neighborhood that's basically four to six blocks north of the existing area that we've been in. This is, there's two projects, mine and one other, about to start over there. Uh, this is the, we, we consider this to be the lead off of, of this area, uh, the development in it. Uh, what we've got is a one acre parcel just a, a fuzz over one acre, and we tried to get, we, we're basically one lot deep on this situation. Uh, 
you know, the easy, simple thing to do would be to leave it alone, leave it as is, and just develop seven houses in a row and have the garages facing the back and the houses facing the front. Instead, what we wanted to do was to create something that would impact and, and bring a little more creativity there. Uh, south of their four blocks, we did a little uh, three-acre addition called Fair Havens within the JFK area that we created a park-like environment, uh, and we're trying to achieve the same thing here. Basically, it's a cluster of seven homes. Uh, we've got some common areas within the corners of it. Uh, in all of the houses, there is no back to the community. Uh, six of the homes share two sets of three, three driveway clusters apiece. Um, the, uh, they share a common homeowners association and a common maintenance type of element to keep all the mowing done. And we've also got a little pavilion type of setup, a little basketball area in one corner, whatever. Uh, we're, I guess this one and the other one both go together. This one and the next one, one of them's the PUD and one of them's the preliminary plat, I guess. Uh, we're fine with all the technical evaluations, except I have three three issues that I need to request or I'm in need consideration of. And, and I apologize. I think I, I probably could have settled uh, the bulk of these with the uh, city. We actually turned in on this January 16th, and just last week we got contact on it uh, before we got to this meeting today. So, and I was out of town and uh, uh, wasn't able to really move and, and figure out all the details till early this week. On uh, the okay, wait, 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 yes, wait. I'm sorry. Let's do one at a time here. First, let's do the rezoning, right? I think okay. you're maybe directing some comments with regard to the, the final plat. So, move approval. Nobody signed up on this one, commissioners. Any, any questions on the rezoning before we get to the well, plat? I just want to I, yeah. Okay. Um. If you look down at the, at the lower left-hand um, corner, there's a block that has a home on it. And there's a little strip. Is that like a common drive area that services the house on the right-hand side, the east side? Is, is there any chance you have the next page? It's either the one before this or the one after one? Yes. It would be the one before, I think. It's the way it is in, the, in our staff report anyway. It's got the shaded areas. Okay, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm trying to follow you. Right, let me see if I can show you on here what I'm talking <laughs> about. These little areas, there's a little rectangle here, there's a little rectangle here. Yes, ma'am, that's are, the common are the drive. Common drives yes. that serve all three of the yes, properties? Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. Yeah, I just want to be sure I knew what I was looking at. We, we also, and one of the things that doesn't show up on the side either, uh, is there's actually three large clusters of existing trees that are there, mature trees. And we're also working around those three large clusters as part of our, our design concept. We, uh, we, we, we feel like our design is just a genius, you know, but I'm a builder, and so that makes me a legend in my own mind. But uh, no, we, we, that, there's a whole bunch of factors there. The reason I point that out is we're trying to, we're trying to hide the driveways, hide, so the place doesn't look like a street of garages. We're also trying to take advantage of the trees that are there. Okay. And uh, also with the the block that's there already. So, okay. I have a couple. I have a couple of questions. Uh, first question: Are these going to be rental units or for sale? They're all for sale houses. For sale. Yes. Okay. And then the other kind of piggybacking on what uh, Janice is uh, talking about. I like the I like the potential uh, design. I think is very creative. I, I tend I, if this is the actual layout of the development the way you have it here. With the common drives, you have two common drives, one coming off of uh, Nebraska and one coming off of Missouri. The problem I have is when I get up to the face of what I believe is a resident, it don't look like there's any room out in front of the garage. It looks like that's going to be real chaotic there. If they don't have all the cars in the garage, it looks like somebody's going to be cut out. Somebody's not going to be able to get to the garage. Uh, the cars are going to stick over into the drive. Uh, it just don't look like there's any room for. You can uh, see James also on Nebraska and Missouri both. We've also got a little bit of cut out there. That's some common area parking. And I'm sorry. On I don't know how you pronounce that name. I call it 13th Street, Uselid, and Nebraska both there. We've got some common area drive. But yeah, you're correct. It's it's yeah, I see the 35 crowd, foot. Area. But I'm just saying, if I pull up, like people gonna have stuff in the garage, and I don't pull it. Only way this works, everybody got to put their car in the garage. 
You know, w one of the elements of our design, that's a good question, one of the elements of our design or the criteria within the, the buildings itself was they've, obviously we're trying to uh, have a, a shared type of yard situation outside and inside both. The inside will have private stockades, but the outside will be open to the streets itself. Uh, we didn't want to have, take a chance or have people with, you know, a little 10 by 10 outbuilding or something like that. Uh, all of the buildings are designed with their own storage areas also, besides the garage also. There's a covered porch on the back and also a storage closet. Yeah, and, and I don't have a problem. I think the concept is great. That was part saying. of my offset to offset what you're saying right there, to be able to allow the garage for parking also. I know it, but how can a car park in front of the garage? Uh, some of the areas are tight. Some of the areas are tight. I won't argue that. Because even on this first area that's uh, south on um, Missouri, when I look at the second resident to the north, uh, the more elongated building, the property line looks like it's only five feet away from the front of the house, uh, what would be the footprint of the house. And that car is just going to be in the driveway. It's I think that's a, I just think that's a, a problem with, you know, it appears to be a problem now. If this is not the house, if you're going to be some other adjustment, maybe that's not the case. But if you know, this is uh, where obviously it's going to be. It is a common, it's a shared drive. Everybody's going to have to, yeah. to get along, but you're right. That, that, James, that would be the one negative of the plan. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, I, my brother-in-law lives in a condominium unit that is, is very much like this. It's, it's the way it's set up. It's, the units on the property are very tight. When you're home, when you're there, you're parked indoors. Uh, if you know, there is a little bit of room um, with respect to each kind of block, and I don't know whether there are just two or maybe there's three in each, you know, building uh, of condos, but um, it is tight. But you know, it works. People are, are you know, considerate and, and they, they pull indoors and they, you know, park to one side. Um, maybe the trade-off is worth it. I don't know. One of, our, one of our missions is to try to make sure that when we see developments, even in the most creative state, that we still make sure that they function so, so it is a good development and we don't end up with some situations that we we really wouldn't want it otherwise, so. I understand. I just think that, I think that needs to be some attention looking at that, you know. I, I'm okay with the zoning, but I just think in that particular area you need to look at that. With that, um, okay. I'll second Todd's motion. Okay, so we're on item number 15, <laughs> rezoning application. Motion to second to approve item. Oh, oh, oh. Apologize. Oh, Okay, well, come on up. My name is, uh, um, thank you for, you know, hearing me today. Um, I've name? never met uh, Mr. Walters here. Sir, I see his property. Could you give us your name? And your My name, name is Lester Taylor. I'm sorry. That's okay. And I live on 13th Street, Northeast 13th Street, directly across from the uh, Truman property. Okay, thank you. And um, I see his, oh no. It's the boss. She'll just have to wait. Okay. I live on Northeast 13th Street, like I said, across from the Truman property. I've lived there for about 20 years. I also own another piece of property next door. I live at 1719. I also own 1723. Now, I am totally and vehemently against Mr. Walter's uh, project. Nothing personal. At one time, I was a real estate broker, licensed in the state of Oklahoma. And I represented buyers. And um, I think that this project, I, I really, I have no idea why he wants to do this, because it makes absolutely zero sense to me at all. For a number of reasons, my wife was at the last meeting. She, she said she read this. But I'll, I'll just kind of go through this briefly. 
the block around the block around that Truman property is already very congested. And uh, what the gentleman here, uh, Mr. Williams, said about he was concerned about space, I can tell you right now, if you put something across the street from me, I don't care what it is, a dog kennel, and you try to, I try to back out of my driveway to go up east or west on 13th Street, I have a problem now and there's nothing there. The street is only two lanes wide with no room for parking. If a person parks on either side of 13th Street or uh, the next street to the south, which is uh, Euclid, I believe, it's the same way. If a person, if there's people try to park on both sides of the street, you can't get through the street. The other thing is at two periods of time during the day, from, uh, let's see, from uh, 8 to 10 in the morning and uh, 3 to 5 in the afternoon, both Missouri and Kellum are basically not passable because of the uh, Moon School on Missouri and the uh, Avery AME Church on Kellum. And at times I've, I've noticed where the bus couldn't even get through because of people parked up there. And there's nothing on the property now. So it's already at its, its limit as far as congestion is concerned. And the Oklahoma, now, let me, let me back up for a second here. The, there is so much dilapidated and abandoned property in the neighborhood that uh, most of us residents who have been meeting now for several months every third Saturday um, uh, to discuss ways to improve the, um, uh, the neighborhood being part of the Strong Neighborhood Initiative <clears throat> here in Oklahoma City. And virtually every meeting that I've attended, which I'd say probably 90% of them or more, and I'm also on the steering committee, um, people have expressed that they don't want any new housing built on that Truman property or anywhere near it. Not only because of the congestion, that, but we feel it would be totally detrimental to the neighborhood. Let me give you an example. The block to the north, Northeast 14th Street, six of the 21 houses are vacant or dilapidated. On Northeast 13th, we're pretty good. Only one of the houses is vacant and dilapidated. On Euclid, two of the seven are vacant and are dilapidated. The block just to the south, Northeast 11th, four of the 17 are vacant and dilapidated. Most of the occupied housing on all of these streets need some kind of work. If you drive through the neighborhood, um, you will see a lot of new sidewalks that have, been, that have been put in. The problem is they're not being maintained. I see broken glass, there's trash, people are throwing trash on, in the street or on the Truman property itself. Now I'm sure that people are going to say, well, we're going to clean that up and keep it cleaned up. Well, sure. Um, the Oklahoma City Board of Realtors records will show that the Culbertson East Highlands Edition neighborhood, all homes sold in the past year or so sold for less than $30,000. I also know of some others in the neighborhood down on 14th Street, um, I'm sorry, not 14th, but 11th Street, that are up for sale for like $23,000, $22,000, and I can tell you they're not worth that. Uh, editorialize a little bit here. No one but an idiot <laughs> would buy a home right in the middle of an area that's in this bad a condition. It makes no sense. We can't seem to get any specific information about the price that these homes are going to sell for, but I heard that any figures from 120,000 to 150,000 to 100,000 dollars. That makes no sense at all, especially my having been a real estate broker. 
If a buyer approached me and said they wanted to buy one of these things, I'd say, you got to be crazy. Not unless you want to live there for the rest of your life. I, 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 need, to, I need to interrupt here. Um, with respect, if you have comments with regard to land use, that's one thing. Okay. We're happy to hear comments with respect to land use. What we're not happy to hear, though, is comments regarding and negative comments about a developer. Well, I'm other, sorry. So I'd ask that you refrain right. from that. I apologize. I'm really little, don't get into the detail upset. value, cost, or otherwise. Okay. Quite frankly, from a land use standpoint, as a we're happy to see new development coming into old and, and dilapidated areas. This is this is this is important to okay. us. Okay. I have one statement and it refers to what you're talking about. Okay. Okay, and I'll be finished. Development of the property mentioned for other than open space situation for the benefit of present or future residents would be detrimental to the neighborhood in that it would increase traffic congestion which is already past the limit and it would create we believe an eyesore for the residents who live on northeast 13th as well as those on euclid the rehabilitation of existing vacant, dilapidated, and abandoned, and a distressed properties in the neighborhood should be the first priority before any more new construction begins. And we feel that that's just common sense. Thank you for that comment. OK. Any questions for the protester? OK. Thank you very much. Chairman, I just I think that uh, in general we, we're welcome in, in uh, Ward 7, especially in this area, we're welcome in new development. I think we have two issues there. I think we have an issue of dilapidated property, but I think we have an issue also of uh, vacant, large parcels of vacant property that's been vacant for 30 years and that there have not been any new housing stock in the area until the last, I said within the last 10 years we've been on a, we've got a momentum going. So we really, we really uh, invite new development. Uh, and we also, there are also things in place for some infill lot developments uh, and some of these dilapidated uh, uh, structures. But I think that's just two different issues. And I think we are moving in the right direction by getting some, and stimulating some new development of, of new housing, housing stock, and more energy efficient housing. I don't think this development will be detrimental to that in our community. I, I do have one more comment. And, and then we can move on if you would like. I do have one more comment about the uh, about the parking, and I, I, I kind of overlooked that. When you mentioned that you had some off-street parking also on each side, one of the things we try to really discourage is parking that, that crosses sidewalks, and, and it appears that the parking that's allocated for the off-street parking, it would straddle the sidewalks, uh, the part down on, uh, I think it's uh, the lower part of uh, Wisconsin, uh, Nebraska, rather, and then the uh, uh, yes, yeah, down on one is on uh, Euclid, around the Commons area. It really appears that if anybody park in those spaces, they're going to block the sidewalks, and and we really don't want that. So you may have to take a look at how to adjust that parking. You know, perhaps we could uh, divert the sidewalks up closer to the paving in that area, and then uh, enlarge the uh, lengthen the. The parking, so yeah, that, that, I'm just saying that's a good point. We really want to take a look at that, and you might look at your driveway up on the uh, north end. Usually, a 15-foot setback will not accommodate a drive uh, without it crossing the parking uh, sidewalk, unless in the front of the house is set back at least 20 feet. We've done some studies to try to prevent some of those things, so we really would like you to look at that. I, I think we'd be more than happy to convert the move the drive move the sidewalks out toward the curb, so we can ride around. The, that's a good idea. So anyway. With that, I'll, I'll, we can go to, on to our motion. I think we have a motion and a second on the floor. Okay, so we have a motion and a second on the zoning. This is the zoning on Which the is item 15, right? Okay, Correct. cast your votes on the zoning, item 15. And that's, Janice, are you voting? Thank you. That's approved. Okay. All right. <laughs> I, only, I only saw five likes, so it's not. Try it again. Try it again. All right, well, yeah, we still got five, though. <laughs> uh, item 16 is the zoning, which is um, the final plat. 
of the same properties. So um, C6437. You know, I, I, I have concerns like you, James. Um, I think rather than basketball court, if you leave it like it is, that's going to have to be a boxing ring out there to determine who gets to park where. Um, I, I think something needs to be done with that design so that we we got some kind of assurance that we've got, you know, you've got a possibility of at least six cars in each one of those driveways and um, probably more than that. Uh, so I, I think we're creating a problem here that's going to be a big problem. It might be a ship with this design. Should we? Well, do you want to take back some of our comments on item 16 and come back to see us? I think that I think that's the better plan versus moving forward with what we really don't know is going to happen. James, what's your view well, on that? Well, I, I would really like to ask Mr. Uh, Walters if he would consider a continuance for a couple of weeks right. to try to address some of these uh, issues because uh, we don't want to create an adverse effect, you know, and we have time, so we might as well take the time and let's try to massage it and get it the way. Well, I think the protester brought some good points with respect to the traffic and the parking in that area, which was second to your, to your concern that are going to be important. I think I'm for the development. I think yeah. that as a commission, I'm for the development, but I think maybe we need to take some time, rework it, maybe meet with some of the neighbors and talk to them uh, and get their view on how to help you with the location of the buildings and the parking, et cetera. And I'll be with you, too, if you would like. Right. I think that would be a good idea. I, uh, I have a couple other issues I, I was hoping to be able to bring before you all, too. I'd kind of like to get y'all's feedback on it if we're going to go back to the drawing board okay. and do some work. Uh, one of the issues we have, we will go back and revisit the, the parking issues. Maybe we just need to add more off-street type of parking. It may be as simple as that if, if we're trying to reduce. Uh, I will admit, uh, contrary to it sounded like my wife there talking for a minute, you know. But... Uh, no, make no bones about it. This is a very, very challenging area. This is a very, very challenging project. I will stand on my track record south of there. We've been here. We've done this. We've made things happen. But what makes it happen is something very, very creative, something that's going to impact the area. Us going up there and throwing straight houses and a street of garages isn't going to fix that. As for the traffic in the area, evidently I haven't been there at the right time, but I don't live in the area. Every time I've been over there, I've parked in the middle of the street. Study things, looked at things, done whatever. So um, that brings me to one of the next issues. So one of the we've we've got issues with three of the T's, and I kind of want to get some feedback from y'all. What was going to happen on this thing? Um, Missouri Avenue, the street on the west side, the backs up against the uh, the Truman, the old Truman School property. There is only a 30 foot right of way um, there for the street. Uh, one of the things that popped up at the last minute there was uh, they wanted us to give up 20 foot more right of way off our property. Originally in 1910 when this block was platted, uh, the right of way wasn't even on this block. It was on the, the west side there that goes, which actually that the other block to the west was platted in 1906. So for 100 years it's been, been okay, but I know standard thing is they want a 50 foot right of way now. Obviously we can't give up uh, 20 feet over there it would destroy the project for us as, as designed. Uh, what we are willing to do on the Nebraska side of the street, we've got uh, an adequate 50 foot right of way there and we've got a 6.67 .6 foot building line. What we are asking for, we'd like to ask for is on the Missouri side to give a 10 foot, additional 10 foot, at least half of that 20 foot that's short and ask for a 6.67 .6 foot building line on it also. Well, thank you. And that would enable us to retain the plan as it is. Plus, that keeps our green space the same distance on both sides from the curbs to the houses. I think what the recommendation said was 15 feet on uh, Nebraska side and an additional 20 feet on uh, Missouri side. Yeah. I think you were asking for six point. I think. Yeah, I don't. I don't think on the the Nebraska side we had any problem at all. On the Missouri side, a 20 foot. Is impossible for us to do. Like I said, I can give 10 foot if I can get a 6.67 .6 foot building line also, because it's only a couple of feet of nominal difference. I tell you what, let's let's discuss that with the staff and everything during this time that we're going to 
Okay, I'm going to do this continuance. Uh, the other issue I have, and this is a deal breaker for us, uh, there is only 25 foot, uh, according to staff report, there's only 25 foot of paving on Missouri Avenue. Uh, 26 foot is a minimum. Uh, and I think our application also asks for variance in that. Will we achieve that or will we not? Because obviously I can't, in this project, afford to repave the street. Right now, you know, we can discuss that too, but right now, Nebraska's just that little one block. I don't see no problem with that. I don't yeah. see no problem with that. Unless the, staff, unless the staff has something different, I don't see it. Thank you for your time. But we're going to continue this uh, yes. for two weeks. I make okay. a motion that we continue this for two weeks. Motion second to continue item 16 for two weeks. Cast your votes. Thank you. Thank so you. Yes. We've con Thanks. We've continued this for two weeks, just so you know. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. Um, <clears throat> all of the uh, next items from item 17 through item 30 have been continued. So we are on item 31. Did we continue item 27 for some reason? I didn't set it aside. It is. All right, so. Uh, item four, is the applicant here on item no, four? No, no. Uh, Mike, I'm inclined on, on item four because that's, there's a, uh, a pizza hut on the corner. I mean, it serves, I believe it serves beer. There's a marble slab. There's, I mean, I, I don't have a, any particular issue with this. I will tell you that I will call the, uh, the applicant. applicant as well as the property owner just to make sure that they understand that they need to be present okay. at the next phase. So I, I don't have any issue with moving approval. Motion to a second to approve item four. It's that a fairly well-behaved ABC. Todd did. Okay, cast your votes. It's approved. <laughs> Okay. Item, item 31 is the public hearing on uh, amendments to section 4.6 of the subdivision regs regarding certificates of occupancy and subdivisions. Um, we have discussed this. Mr. This is uh, the, we've been down this path several times in our conversations. Any comments or further? The only thing I would comment on is in the resolution, I'm going to change some of the wording to match what we actually um, is in the text. It doesn't quite match that, so I'll tweak that a little bit. Okay. Um, do we have any questions? Any? Okay, so we need a motion. Approve. Move approval. With the amendment of the uh, text. Right. Cast your votes. It's approved. And item 32 is an ordinance to be introduced, set for public hearing on March 28th. This amends chapter 59, uh, enacting new sections establishing the Lincoln Boulevard Overlay District. Uh, commissioners, we talked this up, took this up last time. I guess we should move this to our March 28th docket and discuss it at that particular moment for up or down. Do it. Well, one of the things we were concerned with last time, it didn't have any boundaries. It, right. Well, I, 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 said, I don't think it's changed in its... Well, uh, it's, they set the boundaries now. It's from right. 30th to 50th. 30th to 50th, that's true. Yeah. And last time, we didn't know where or what it was about. It's trying to stimulate some... I talked to Councilman Kelly on it, and, you know, it's trying to stimulate the possibility of some commercial development along uh, uh, that portion of uh, Lincoln Boulevard. Uh, Met with the uh, capital zoning, uh, and uh, so be it. Okay. So what are we going to do? Move to set it for hearing on the 28th. So move. Second. Cast your votes. Item 33, uh, we are introducing an amendment to the comprehensive plan today. Um, this is establishing uh, new land use designations, which we're calling employment reserve. Uh, and we'll set that for hearing on April the 11th. And Jeff Butler from 
The uh, Planning Department is here to talk about that. You may remember we had a lot of conversations about the employment land study last year. So in Jeff has uh, these recommendations in response to some of uh, the discussion on that plan. Okay, let me uh, run through. I think most of you have been uh, have seen some of this material, but let me run through a quick summary of the employment land study real quick, and then we'll get on to the employment reserve uh, recommendations and what we're proposing for the comprehensive plan. Um, what we, uh, the purpose, uh, Russell uh, talked about a little bit, uh, the purpose of the study, and um, we have some challenges in the city. Uh, we have a lot of land, but we don't have a lot of, that is serviced. And in fact, uh, Roy Williams from the chamber was speaking to the city council not too long ago. I believe it was the last council meeting um, discussing this and, and, and again urging uh, the council to uh, facilitate some action on this particular issue. But we have uh, some challenges. We have parcelization that's uh, fragmenting the land that we do have. We don't have sufficient infrastructure um, that makes the land ready to, to uh, develop. Um, so we undertook the employment land plan with cooperation uh, from the Chamber of Commerce. And uh, the focus was on large sites uh, and recommending steps to make them suitable for, uh, for large employers. So we want to preserve, assemble, and uh, serve those sites. Um, so again, the focus on, is on large sites, 100 plus acres, ideally even larger. Some companies uh, need quite large sites, several hundred acres even. Um, but we felt that our policies were not adequate to ensure that we have sufficient supply both now and in the future, so we're trying to correct that. Uh, we can expect, and this is a conservative estimate, to absorb about 80 acres. Um, that's uh, what we're projecting. Um, however, we do have variable demand, so in any given year we could need 400 acres. So we need to be prepared with a lot more than just 80 acres um, so that we can have the market choice we need, for example. We have need multiple sites to be able to show uh, potential um, employers that are coming into town or those who want to stay and just need more space. Um, so two or three site options of, of several different types. We're talking about warehousing, manufacturing, high-tech research office park, all those types of uh, uses. Uh, different size sites is what we need. And we think that if we have a supply of roughly a thousand acres, and this is serviced land, not just not just empty land, um, then, then we'll be in good shape. So uh, real brief, this is uh, one of the maps that came out of the study. This is just a citywide analysis that we did to look at the, the uh, suitability of different areas of the city. Um, and that resulted in a, sm a smaller, uh, a bunch of smaller areas that were called study areas, uh, the ones in, in red here. And what we've done is we've taken these study areas and adapted them for the employment reserve category in uh, OKC plan. Uh, some minor differences, and maybe, maybe not so minor in one case, uh, the middle one you can see right next to the fairgrounds, we're proposing that that uh, not be forwarded to the, to the, comp the comprehensive plan because uh, that has uh, been compromised by uh, some other development, uh, uh, which is good development. It's a school and also North Care facility. Uh, but they, they are taking place, they're happening right in the middle of the site, and so it's just not feasible anymore. So we're proposing that that not be carried forward. Some other modifications, too, uh, which we talked about in the last study session, and I can address those if you'd like. Um, but this map shows the, um, the 14 proposed areas, uh, and I'll go through these real quickly one by one. This one is uh, on Nor North Rockwell and Kilpatrick Turnpike. Um, so on the very left side there is actually the PACOM site. Um, and we actually included the PACOM site and it's the, the parcel immediately to the north since we last spoke with you with the study session. Um, second one is on Western and just south of Kilpatrick. Uh, third one is over to the east, Kelly and Britain. Uh, and then four is Wilshire and I-35. Fifth is the school land site um, down on I-240. That's a, that's a nice site uh, in, a lot, in a lot of ways because it's own, it has one property owner, but it does have some issues that we're trying to look at, uh, see what we can do about that. Uh, this is south of the airport, southwest 104th. 
and Meridian. Uh, a couple sites to the west of that, northwest of that, um, just east of Mustang. And this is another school land site on MacArthur and Airport Road, a pretty big site. Uh, another one, Council and Southwest 29th. And finally, uh, the last four sites or areas, I should say, are clustered along the Northwest Expressway and the Kilpatrick Turnpike. So just a quick summary of, uh, of what's going to happen, what we pr propose to change in the comprehensive plan. Um, the directions, the, the key ones are to protect the viability of future industrial or office developments in these areas and then to support infrastructure improvements. Um, so as, as you see those in capital future capital facilities plans, uh, have the opportunity to support those, the plan will, will uh, back us up there. Um, actions, uh, we want to try and preserve uh, those areas, the ER areas, to be used for large-scale employment uses. Uh, and it, it, may be, uh, it may be good to have a little bit of smaller scale uses, and those could be industrial, those could be a little bit of commercial to serve the areas, but uh, when those are allowed, uh, we're hoping that, we're proposing that they, the policy be that they are um, developed in such a way as to not fragment uh, or, or uh, harm in any other way the employment reserve area. And that we prohibit uh, uh, single family homes, mobile homes, uh, uh, K-12 schools, things that are not really appropriate for a uh, business park type setting or an industrial park type setting. And uh, that, that concludes the, uh, the formal the presentation. I just wanted to mention that we have, um, for Plan OKC, we, we are proposing to carry these areas forward in Plan OKC. There will be a little more detail added. Um, so, and as of now, we expect it will be called something really similar, probably employment reserve. Um, and they, the areas themselves may change, may be adjusted a little bit based on um, other considerations as we develop the future land use plan. Uh, but we wanted to get this uh, before you, um, given the urgency that is felt by us in the chamber in protecting these, uh, these lands. So I think that uh, concludes my comments, unless you have any questions for me. One quick question. Sarah, could you go back to the slide that shows parcel number one? I had parcel number one out here in front of me. <laughs> I understand that slide. My question of staff, but I, can you go back and look, see if it, any of the land to the west to council and to the north to 164th would also be appropriate to be included in there? I know you're, we're going farther north, but I'm, I question whether we're we're missing something. Uh, other than that, I have no comments, and I'd move to set. Okay. The uh, okay. So just so I'm, I, I understand, I was I'm, I don't recall. I think I missed a study session on the 14th. I, apologies for that. This parcel number one, for example, that I'm looking at, I see MacArthur, Rockwell, and then. I don't know where this designation ends. I see the Kilpatrick, and then I see 150th, right? I'm not trying to get too precise with this, but I'm not sure where. If somebody came in today and said, hey, I've got a big old tract of land out here at, you know, Rockwell and uh, Pickett, north of the Kilpatrick, and so we say, it's already zoned R1 out there most likely, right? Well, most of one. Most of the land that's included in one now is, is pretty much already spoken for. That's what I thought. Uh, it's yeah. So there, it, most of that is covered by a couple of different large PUDs, right? Um, much of which is commercial and in, employment land related. Yeah. Some of it is is residential, yeah. But uh, Mike, what I'm questioning is if <clears throat> there isn't some more land viable north and west of here, yeah, that is also viable for consideration in this zone. That, that, and it may not be. Uh, Understood. But like today, we had one that we rezoned or recommended rezoning on north of 150th on the west side of Rockwell. I mm -hmm. question whether that should be in. Uh, but 
Okay. You know, it, it's, it's... I mean, I appreciate the need. That, that, you know, if we don't address it now, we're, you know... Yeah. Address it now or forever, hold your peace. Right. Yes. Yeah, I, I understand. And when the consultants were reviewing this, um, I, I don't know what the specific reasons for this particular shape. Um, I, I'm sure they had good reasons. I don't know if... Well, this, this actually used to go to 150th, and uh, there was a, a, a there's a new subdivision going in. You know, one of the things that was explained to me was uh, so it's already subdivided. We just didn't simply didn't look north of 150th. Well, we only have one more mile of city limits north of 150th. Our city limits die at 164th. So, you know, I'm not saying anybody's interested in that for employment reserve, but. I mean, they, they, they looked at multiple criteria. One of them would have been access to uh, the freeway system. So sure. the further north you go, and then uh, utilities, and, and I don't know what their rationale would be one way or the other. But yeah, um, this it, it probably is. I mean, there are other sites, obviously, that are viable if they're vacant, except that the cost factor may have been prohibited. I mean, there's a certain mm -hmm. point where they cut a threshold and said, this is what we believe. Well, I understand, but uh, for example, Rockwell, we're, we're improving that road all the way up. Uh, obviously, there's turnpike access at council, uh, so. Well, we'll look, we'll look at it. Yeah, this, th this was this and the others, um, the other that, that are just around the curve of the t turnpike. Uh, they were kind of the north, the ones that we considered and the consultants considered would be the best for kind of the northwest area of the city. We didn't really look north of 150th because at the time we were doing the study, this area west of Rockwell and south of 150th was included. But, you know, things happen during the course of a study and, and that's been proposed for development. So we hadn't looked at that because it was a little further away from the turnpike and that was one of the key considerations. So the other ones are actually along the turnpike. Uh, just over further west, but we can look at that. That was that was scored and evaluated. We just want to get the policies in place. Um, you know, the, the boundaries on these can we can change those over time and add additional areas if we if we circumstances change that, that make them more viable. Uh, the intent was at least to get started on this, um, since as as Jeff pointed out, you know, we just took one area out and uh, Roy Williams in his presentation to City Council last week indicated that they have, they're, they're a, a super urgent situation. They can't find any land um, on the south side of the city, more than 20 acres, and they are turning away uh, potential employers. Now, the other part of this, this is just to protect this so that this land is available. The other part of this is to facilitate this land being shovel ready. So that requires a process of probable acquisition and rezoning and, and, and provision of infrastructure to be able, able to develop these lands. This is just one small piece of the, the larger uh, game plan for facilitating these lands being available for employers, large employers. They find any on the east, what's up? Um, all the heavy industrial over there. Now we've got those up on the, the northeast side. There were several up there on the um, oh, further up northeast. F further northeast. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the difficulty there is the infrastructure is not there. Oh, okay. It's, it's a long way from water, but but the land itself is otherwise well positioned and well suited for that. Sometime between now and April 11th. I, I, if we've had a study session on this, I guess I missed it too, and I'm really sorry about that. Uh, but I, I would like to sit down with somebody who can give me a lot more background on this than we need to take up time here today to walk through. Um, but yeah, I, I would like to have some explanation about why exactly we feel the need to do this and what it ex exactly that we're doing and you know what we hope to accomplish by it. Okay. Commissioners, we had a motion, did we? Yes. Second, set for public hearing on April 11. Catch your votes. It's set. Thank you. Uh, item 34 is continued until April 11th. Item 35 is another ordinance to be introduced and set for public hearing on March the 28th uh, regarding further changes to Chapter 59 
uh, relating to the Neighbourhood Conservation District Tract 5 regulations. And this deletes a limitation on revocable permits for festivals and events in the public right away. And this is the Paseo. Some district. things just don't go away. <laughs> I'll move to set. <laughs> Motion to second to set item 35 for hearing on the 28th. Cast your votes. That's set. That is the last of the regular list of items. Okay. Uh, Planning Commission committees, Planning Commission members, Commissioner Powers. I would like to, well, is the, the fire guy still here? Is he still back in the background? Yeah. Is he still? He had to go to a building, a court of appeals meeting. Uh -huh. He left, he had to go to another meeting Okay. at three. I would just like for that to be looked into and maybe give us a kind of a detailed report, maybe next meeting about the fire suppression. I asked uh, Mike early in the week about uh, coming up with some uh, cost guidelines. Well, cost and, you know, what, well. what the insurance companies are doing and, you know, if it's not, if it's not saving anything and cost is way out, we're having trouble selling houses, uh, maybe we ought to take us. Okay, well, he's looking at back. that and we'll bring something back. I think it's interesting this is kind of coming full circle now. Yeah, this is the very first meeting I sat on as a planning commissioner was about fire suppression. I didn't support it then. Home builders didn't support it. And I think this is what you're, Jim, what you're seeing well, is the you truth know, coming I, out. I, su um, I supported it only because I felt like it was, you know, a, a safety thing. Uh, and I felt like it, but, you know, as we were told, it was going to save insurance money. And, you know, there were several things, and I, I think that's not exactly, you know, exactly where we are, because I'm, we're, we're here in reality now. Commissioner Powers. Um, we had a, um, an illustration today of a problem that's kind of um, uh, recurs for us here, and, and I'm not sure that there's any way to solve it, but I would like for us to put on our thinking caps and see what we can do about it. Um, you know, when, when matters are continued, especially when they're continued, you know, um, on the spur of the moment here in front of us, well, actually, when they're continued before we come to hearing, but they're not really, really continued until we vote on them. And right. what happens is, very often, it's the protestants, it's the people, not the lawyers and engineers who are getting paid by the hour to come and sit on these soft, cushy benches. Um, but um, the people who have to take off work and find a parking place and do all that to come down here and speak to us um, who, you know, show up just to find out or be told that, oh, this is going to be continued or, you know, there wasn't really any reason for you to come down here today or whether you like it or not, it's being continued or whatever. And I, I, I know it's very difficult for us to know in advance whether something will or won't be. And it, we don't always have contact information for everybody. But I would like for us to think about whether there is some way that we can make available that information so that at least people can kind of make an informed decision about whether they need to come down here. They can, you know, call the applicant or the applicant's representatives and, you know, find out whether they're agreeing to a continuance or, you know, whatever. Um, and, the flip side of that being the issue of agreed continuances. Um, you know, I, I heard uh, Commissioner Gale say today that we routinely grant both sides one continuance. Um, but I had it sort of in my mind and had heard many times before that it's up to the applicant to decide whether a matter gets continued or not. And if they don't agree, then they have a right to have it heard and so forth. I think we need to decide what our policy is about that. Me personally, I'm, you know, willing to accommodate people as best we can and certainly if, if they can come to some agreement between themselves and it's not really an issue. But um, I, I think we need to know what our policy is and be even handed about applying it. So that's my little soapbox speech for today. All right. Planning department. 
Um, well, we didn't hear all the items for the study session. We have uh, the one that Jeff was going to present, and, and that's general demographic analysis, which is um, informative in terms of understanding what's happening in the city, trends that are part of the whole comprehensive plan process. So um, we'll present that ne next time. Uh, I think you'll find it pretty interesting. And uh, we are currently in the plan OKC process. We're meeting with each of the departments, with the department heads, and going over all the policies that relate directly to them out of all the different elements of the plan and making sure that we are all on the same page, that we are representing what is important to them what if for their mission. And those meetings have been very, very good so far. Uh, they appreciate the fact that the plan will be a consolidated overview of all the different departments' mission, that we'll all be working together, um, which is different from what it has been in the past. So uh, that, is, that is going very well. And when we wrap that up, then we will end up back at the citizens advisory team, um, I, I guess, sometime in April. I, I don't have a specific date yet. And we're also going back out to the public as well. That would be early April. All right, development services, municipal council, citizens to be heard. Motion to adjourn. Okay, we're adjourned. <laughs>